Okay. All right. Looks like I can go ahead and get us started with the script. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us at Secular AZ today. We are a nonprofit organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state now for over a decade. Um, if you, as you are trickling in here, uh, go ahead and make sure that you uh, leave your name in the chat. Where are you joining us from? Uh, and get to know your secular uh, neighbors. <laughs> All right, one second here. There we go. Let me get back to my script. Um, all right, so we've had some incredible programming, including our Friday updates from all kinds of speakers. Uh, we have historians, authors, elected officials, journalists. Uh, next Friday, we're going to be hearing from a friend of mine, Jess Lark, a parent of someone who is incarcerated in Arizona, and they'll be speaking about their family's experience. We'll be wrapping up this series at the end of the month, and we're putting together another series about abuse happening in religious organizations. So if you are somebody who is an expert in um, abuse cover-ups, if you were affected by abuse uh, from a religious organization, we'd really like to hear from you. Um, our day near the Capitol is happening on Monday, April 10th, and that's right after the American Atheist Conference that's happening in Phoenix. So be sure to sign up and attend, and I hope that you will all support our work at secularaz.org and become a recurring donor to, to support our work at the legislature, school boards, action alerts. Uh, John Dacey is joining us today, though, and I'm really excited about it. He is the founder, uh, the co-founder and executive director of Abolish Private Prisons, an Arizona nonprofit law firm. Since 1977, John has worked for poverty and disability law centers, and he was in private practice where many of his clients provided services to beneficiaries of Arizona's Medicaid pro program. John is now part of a legal team that represents incarcerated individuals and the Arizona State Conference of the NAACP, who are challenging the constitutionality of private prison, pri pri prison privatization in court. Uh, and we're also going to be joined today by Robert Craig. Uh, Robert Craig graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Law School in 2012. He clerked for Judge Andy Hurwitz on the Ninth Circuit for one year, followed by a three-year clerkship with Judge James Soto of the District Court of Arizona. He volunteered with Abolished Private Prisons over the fall of 2017 and joined the team full-time in 2018. Immediately after graduating from the University of Arizona, Robert taught fifth grade in Phoenix for two years as part of Teach for America. That experience sparked a passion for working with underserved communities that continued through law school, during which he worked for the school district of Philadelphia's general counsel office, the equal, I'm sorry, the equal employment opportunity commission and the civil practice clinic. So this work is very important and I'm sure it's important to a lot of you. So please uh, visit their websites. I know Lindsay's gonna put the links into the chat. Um, and uh, did I miss anything from your bios? Yes. Okay. Oh, I did? I, I think you covered our bios. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Feel free to share your screens. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat or in the Q&A. Let's get this party started. Hello, everyone. And, and um, Jean, thank you very much to Secular Arizona for this opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Um, uh, we uh, chose the name abolish private prisons quite deliberately. We selected the verb abolish because we wanted to hearken back to the pre-Civil War abolition movement. Um, because as we'll get to later in our discussion, we do regard privatization of prisons and incarcerating people for profit as a form of slavery. The um, well, private prisons, well, I'm sorry, abolish private prisons is an Arizona 501c3 uh, corporation, nonprofit corporation, founded in 2015. And in 2020, we filed our first lawsuit um, against the Arizona Department of Corrections to uh, challenge the, the very constitutionality of prison privatization. More on that in a bit. Just to define our terms, um, when we refer to private prisons, uh, we are talking about the circumstance where the operation of a prison is turned 
over by government to a private for-profit corporation. In Arizona, all three of the large prison corporations um, have contracts with the Arizona Department of Corrections. Um, and that includes uh, CoreCivic, which used to be called Corrections Corporation of America, Geo Group, and Management and Training Corporation. The first two are publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. We have 12 private prisons in Arizona, six of which contract with the Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry. I'll refer to them as corrections just because it's easier to say. Um, but we have other private prisons in Arizona that import people that are incarcerated uh, by other states and by uh, various federal agencies as well. So um, we think Arizona might as well be ground zero as much as any other state for challenging the constitutionality of prison privatization. Um, in June of 2020, we filed that first lawsuit and, and let me ask my colleague, uh, Robbie Craig to jump in and, and start talking about that as well. Sure. Um, just wanted to say a, a couple more things before we jump into the lawsuit real fast. It's we really like when people ask questions during rather than saving them all to the end, because I think it, you know, it's more impactful if we get to it while the topic's going. And I think it keeps everybody's interest more rather than just listening to us talk for a long time. Um, so if you have any questions, let us know. I'm looking at the chat. I think there's a way, you know, try to get to those as quickly as possible. Um, John mentioned how we talk about private prisons. Today, we're mostly going to be talking about the, the sort of complete encapsulation of the facility. Um, but we're also going to talk a little more broadly about privatization in criminal justice uh, as, a, as a whole, um, what that looks like on the front end and the back end. But as, a, as an organization, we've been focused on the private prison itself, but there's also a lot that happens uh, through the, the entire criminal justice system and how that profit motive can really mess things up throughout the, the whole, uh, you know, from the time laws are made till people are on uh, any kind of post-supervision release or anything like that. So we're going to cover a bunch of that um, outside of just prisons. Um, so we filed our lawsuit uh, in 2020, as John said, and um, it, you know, lawsuits go through a lot of these weird procedural steps. We it was dismissed once. We filed an amended complaint. Right now, we're in front of the Ninth Circuit. Um, actually, our our deadline for filing a brief is today, and so that's that's going through uh, a process right now. And um, we hope to talk to a panel of Ninth Circuit judges in a few weeks. Um, so that's sort of the status of the lawsuit. Um, one thing that we get asked about a lot is why focus on private prisons when, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of problems in criminal justice. Uh, when you look at the numbers, it, it changes a lot by state and specifically what you're talking about. But in the range of something like 10% of people that are incarcerated are incarcerated in private facilities. And so we often get asked like, hey, why are you guys focused on this 10%? There's this other 90% that's public and that's also problematic. And we agree. Um, but we really think that private prisons are this like core issue because they do so much to prop up the system. And we'd like to get to a place where when people are making decisions about what criminal justice looks like, a profit motive is not one of those things that goes into it. We want to see data-driven people. We want to see experts. We want to see people with compassion um, to talk about the right way to move forward. And so we think we, we often think of it like a three-legged stool in terms of what criminal justice looks like. And if we can kick one of those legs out, the profit motive, hopefully we can topple the whole thing and we can actually you know, make some progress about what should criminal justice look like in the United States? And why are we so far behind the rest of the world when it comes to things you know, like decriminalization and supporting people that are, are incarcerated and, and all of those different topics? So despite the fact that only about 10% of people are in private prisons, we think the fact that when laws are getting made and when decisions are getting made, that profit motive has such a strong influence, we think getting rid of that will help move the whole sort of process forward. John, do you want to talk about this? Like, and so, you know, there's this question: Are they are they impacting policy? Because if you go to their websites, they have a a trade group called the Day One Alliance, and if you go to their website, 
they will swear up and down till the cow, cows come home that they're not impacting policy. You know, they, they're just this passive partner of the government, right? And they're just responding to needs and that there's no problem here because all they're doing is just fulfilling this need. So the 10%, um, as Rob says, varies by state. So you get to that 10% first by including the 20 to 25 states where the percent is zero because they don't use private prisons at all. And six states, I think, have now adopted legislation that actively prohibits the industry and the state. The state of Washington, I think, was the latest in 2021 to pass such legislation. Other states have much higher percentages of the number of people they incarcerate in private facilities. Montana and New Mexico, for example, are around 40%. Arizona is among the top five states in terms of the percentage of our citizens that we incarcerate and the percentage of uh, those people we place in private prisons. I think the numbers, um, they fluctuate, but I think on any given day, Arizona has between 7,500 and 8,000 uh, people incarcerated in private prisons, which places us around 20% of our prison populations. Um, the industry itself, in terms of how it's compensated, um, I, would, I would use hotels or hospitals as analogies to industries that are institutional based and the economic model fails if the beds are empty. And um, it's, it's a good thing in terms of the public purpose, when our crime rates go down and our prisons start to empty because things are getting better and we're getting smarter, um, but that's not good. For business, if you're a shareholder um, or an executive with a private prison corporation. And so just to illustrate that point, the, the two publicly traded uh, Prison corporations, CoreCivic and Geo Group, are uh, their shares are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. There's a couple of things about that. Number one, this statement that's on the screen now, um, you will find in their annual K1, K1 or K10. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on their annual filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But you can see there's a there's basically a red flag to their shareholders and potential investors. The demand for our facilities and services could be adversely affected by the relaxation of enforcement efforts, leniency and conviction of parole standards and sentencing practices. Well, this industry was involved in the development of model sentencing legislation years ago that produced such things as truth and sentencing, three strikes and you're out, mandatory minimums, and at least according to one article from um, NPR's Laura Sullivan, um, the private prison industry was behind the financing of the efforts to pass Arizona's Senate Bill 1070, which the U.S. Supreme Court struck down in part. Um, and as you can see from a, just a summary from that article, um, the industry that, that stood to benefit from passage of that law was the private prison industry. John, we so, gotta, before yeah, you, we got like a few questions. Gene, is that what you were yeah. planning? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um, first from Jess, will, will addressing private prisons also help address private services like absurd fees for communication and, and medical care? So uh, we work very closely with an organization called Worth Rises who, who focuses more on the services part. Um, and we focus as an organization more just on the like the structure of the entire facility being privatized. Um, but I do think that there's this really interesting sort of overlap in what we do. And I, I think the more that we can get people in general and also courts to recognize that the profit motive has a really adverse consequence on the people inside of a facility and on policy at large. I think the more that we move our case forward in, in sort of tackling the core issue, those other uh, sort of parallel issues to us also get moved forward. So 
when for our lawsuit specifically, it's sort of a tangential effect um, about you know just getting people to recognize that that privatization has that perverse incentive. We talk about the the profit motive being a perverse incentive for all of these things, and there's very similar perverse incentives with all of the things that you mentioned, communications, medical care, et cetera. Um, you, the, the way that you phrase that makes me think that you're probably aware of what used to be called the Parsons litigation. And, and it's gone by a bunch of different names now, but long, long standing litigation in Arizona um, about how, how really just you know, nearly non-existent the privatized medical care is in Arizona public facilities. And uh, the, the way that one of the judges, because it's multiple judges I've worked on it at this point, because it's been around so long, is that private, the, like the, the medical care in the public facilities is not bad despite being privatized, but because of the privatization, you know? So based on a bunch of court experts and the, the documentation and uh, evidentiary hearings, they found that the privatization was directly linked to the, the services being worse. So, so short answer we're working on sort of parallel paths with that um and just trying to move that idea of perverse incentives forward um john i think this next one you'll have uh some insight into could you recap a part the part about uh corrections was that azdoc the i'll answer that really quickly and the next part can be you so they they're the name of the department of corrections now is adcrr arizona department of corrections rehabilitation and reentry um and so it, it follows this trend for me of this like Orwellian language. Um, you know, they're not in the business of rehabilitation and reentry. They're in the business of corrections. And so that's how we keep referring to them. But that also ties in. And if you're paying attention to what John said earlier about naming the three big corporations, if you think about their names, it's Core Civic, Geo Group, and Management and Training Corporation, none of which tells you what they do, right? Uh, they, they intentionally hide what they're doing, which is incarcerating people for profit into these vague names that don't mean anything, core civic, right? Like geo group, what does that mean? Management and training corporation. You would think that they're in the business of like consulting or training managers or something like that. And a key part of that is because they want to hide what they're doing from the public, um, at least in, in my mind. John, the, the next question says, you said something about six prisons having non-Arizona folks. Do you want to go into uh, a little bit of like how those things are structured, it, it, whether it's different cell blocks or entire prisons or how, what the populations look like. So, so we have several prisons um, that take uh, people from multiple states. Arizona has um, received uh, people committed to the corrections agencies of states like Hawaii, we still do, Alaska, I believe Vermont, Nevada, California, and uh, I think more recently, Kansas. And in those circumstances, the Arizona uh, Department of Corrections is not involved in terms of either the contracting process or the supervision of those facilities. In fact, I had a, a conversation at one point with a, direct, a director of the Arizona Department of Corrections, and I asked him, how do you supervise those facilities that are not under contract to your department? And his answer was, we don't. They're not our responsibility. So the other agencies that contract with some of those other private facilities include the U.S. Marshal Service, the um, I believe the Federal Bureau of Prisons sometimes piggybacks on those uh, U.S. Marshal Service contracts for people that have short sentences. Um, ICE, of course, is um, also a big contractor. What we what we know is that that about eighty percent of people who are detained civilly, not criminally, but detained civilly by ICE are also placed in private facilities. Many of them also owned or operated or both by these same companies. So um, I hope that answers the question. I, there's a couple of facilities, I think, in Eloy um, that have different wings that include uh, uh, people incarcerated from different states other than Arizona. 
I hope that answered the question. And there, there's one more here that I, it, I think it really goes to the core of how private prisons look today. And it's, does the private prison industry have any economic incentives to reform and rehabilitate people or are they strictly into housing and little else? And that is, you can tell exactly what the incentives are because of how the contracts are structured, right? The, at least in the United States and the contracts that we've seen, the way that it works is they are paid by what they call a compensated mandate. And again, with this Aurelian language, right? What they're, they talk about it in terms of mandates, which reduces these people to units of you know, commoditization on a balance sheet. And so the only way that they get paid is by a, a, a day that a person is deemed to be in their control, right? And so you can, you can get a, a accurate sense of how much money they're going to make by looking at the agreed upon rate of compensated mandate, multiplying that by the number of beds, and then the length of the contract, um, which two crazy things about how the contracts are structured. They are often very long-term contracts, um, 10, 15, 20 years uh, that the state guarantees that they're going to operate, basically pay these private corporations to operate the facility. And then the really crazy thing is that they, the state often, but not always, guarantees a minimum occupancy rate, often in the ballpark of 90%. So whether or not those beds are filled, the state is going to be paying 90% of the maximum bed capacity multiplied by the compensated mandate. So the incentives are actually the exact opposite of rehabilitation and reform. The incentives are actually to make sure that people stay in the criminal justice system so that more and more facilities need to get built and then more and more contracts for 20 years get signed, right? It's not the only possible model. There is at least one facility that we know about that's in, it's either New Zealand or Australia um, that is paid based on performance markers. And, and you can you know, the, think about different performance markers, but they do care about rehabilitation um, and recidivism rates. And so there is a different way to structure a private prison contract rather than simply paying per compensated mandate. But at least in the United States that we're aware of, we haven't found any of those. They're these very simple uh, compensated mandate by X beds by X years structure. And I saw John was leaning in there. He probably wants to correct or clarify at least something I said. No, it's, it's you know, if you take the word prison out of it and you just think of these as for-profit corporations, um, much of the behavior is going to look like um, any other large corporations that you may deal with and, and that contracts with government. So they only exist to make a profit. If this industry was not making a profit, it would not exist. And they would leave this responsibility in the hands of government, which is where we believe it should lie exclusively. But um, any business wants to sustain itself and, and then to increase profits and its brand, it wants to grow. Well, if your business is incarcerating people, um, you sustain yourself by making sure that the people that are giving you contracts and renewing your contracts are friendly to your industry. So some of the ways you do that is you send lobbyists out to the various state capitals and, and Capitol Hill, and you make campaign contributions to people you believe are going to be your friends when they're in office. Um, so there is this 800 pound gorilla that has been created solely by taxpayer dollars. This industry is funded by taxpayer dollars. The customers are the government exclusively. The second thing is if, if you're a business and you have one product and your product is ever threatened, well, you have to adopt other kinds of business practices to protect yourself. One is to find new markets. And another thing is to create new products. And this industry does both. So it goes into other markets, even in Arizona. So for example, the city of Mesa contracts with CoreCivic for some of its jail services. Um, and this industry has gone global, as Rob mentioned, especially in the United Kingdom. 
So they create other products such as for-profit probation and parole, collection of court fees and fines, community supervision, community corrections, ankle bracelets, bail bonds. And there was a story out of Casa Grande that, that um, showed them getting into the front end of law enforcement. I don't know if we have that slide, Rob, but there was a story from, I believe, 2012 where, where three police agencies were going out to a, a public high school or two with drug sniffing dogs. Um, the school was locked down and the dogs were sniffing the students' lockers to, for drugs. And the reporter noticed that there were some employees from uh, Corrections Corporation of America out on this sweep and asked the police agencies, what are they doing on a police raid? And the answer was they're part of the law enforcement community. Like hell they are. They're not sworn peace officers. What they are is one of the largest employers in Pinal County. Um, and um, they're out there to keep their beds full. And what I found disturbing about the story beyond that was the fact that the drug sniffing dogs were owned and trained by the private prison corporation, not the police agencies. So, so in any event, um, once we embed this lucrative profit incentive in our criminal justice system, we've created an incentive that is at odds with rehabilitation and successful reentry and alternatives to incarceration and decriminalization. And, and so that's one of the major reasons we decided to take up this work. I, I do want to go back to um, our organization's um, founding um, just for this reason. The last thing we wanted to do when creating Abolish Private Prisons is to duplicate the work being done by other advocates already and then to compete with them for limited uh, uh, funding to do that kind of work. And we only operate on private donations. What we found is that while there are a lot of advocates that are opposed to prison privatization and other profit incentives in criminal justice, no one had taken the issue to the courthouse as we have. So we wanted to fill that particular niche. And to our knowledge, we remain the only organization doing that. And while we did um, uh, have uh, a federal judge in Phoenix disagree with us in terms of our analysis of the Constitution, we're now going to be asking an appellate panel to look at that. And we are also working with advocates in other states to challenge their state's usage of prison privatization as well. Beth asked, if people are moved to Arizona from faraway states, how do their friends and family visit them? And the, the short answer is they don't. Um, they, you, know, you can imagine the kinds of people that are most likely to get caught up in criminal justice reform, which is you know, people of color and poor people in general that don't have the means to sort of fight the system itself. And then you take them thousands of miles away from their family. In the case of Hawaii, the only way to get there is this you know, long, extensive flight. Um, John mentioned some of the other places where people are sent from. So the short answer is they basically don't. And we do know that one of the, one of the indicators for whether somebody is going to be able to sex successfully you know, transition away from the criminal justice system is family support. Um, you know, just you can see how this is not conducive to those kinds of things. Um, I, I do think it's worth mentioning, in addition to these like out of state transfers, another thing that happens is even within the same state, these private prisons are often in far flung rural communities because number one, that's where land's cheap. And so they can build these facilities for cheaper and increase their profit uh, margin. Um, there's, there's a lot of like really complicated uh, synergies that happen with these rural communities who you know need these jobs and and all of that stuff and then the state become they become reliant on the state the state becomes reliant on these systems um and another thing is just as a society we tend to want to keep criminal justice out of sight out of mind um so it ends up being even if you're in the same state because of where these private prisons are it's even hard to visit them especially in a you know a large state like arizona different in a state like 
Vermont or whatever, although Vermont is currently sending their people that are in private facilities to Mississippi. So um, you can you can see how a lot of this dovetails with each other to make it extremely difficult to, to for family members to visit. Um, we, we, we think about one of the ways that we think about uh, the different ways that privatization affects criminal justice reform and, and private prisons in general is to think about it like in the timeline. Um, you think about when the laws are made, when somebody is in the court and then during detention and then after they get released. And I think we've covered a lot of the policy stuff, you know, the, the lobbying, uh, the way that they get involved on the front end with the, the drug dogs. And there's uh, lots of examples like that. Um, but I think another way that you see this perverse incentive really play out in a, in a tough way is literally when you're in the courtroom. Um, and it, this is increasingly a long time ago now, but there was a, a while back this kids for cash scandal out of Pennsylvania. And at the time, I did not realize that it the privatization angle. Um, but the, the short story of what was happening is a real estate developer worked with these two juvenile judges in Pennsylvania and said, you know, I can build this private juvenile detention facility, but the economics only work out if I can guarantee that a bunch of, you know, that it's going to stay full. And so he was paying kickbacks to these two juvenile court judges for every kid that they sent to this private facility, which is awful in itself because you see the rates of things that normally would not deserve detention at all, you know, simple possession of drugs, first time users, all of this kind of thing being sent to these private detention facilities. And the thing that really made this a national scandal is a mom had reached out to local law enforcement and her son was sort of getting involved in drugs and talked to a couple of police officers and wanted to have like a scare them straight moment. The kid ends up in one of these judges that's receiving kickbacks, gets sent to a private facility and commits suicide all over something that should never have entered the system in the first place. And I think you can really see how that profit motive does things that uh, when, when no money is involved, just doesn't happen, right? Like that whole system is built on the fact that the judges were receiving direct monetary kickbacks for every kid that they were sending away. Um, and then John, do you wanna talk about the, the immigration raid? Yeah, so, you know, obviously the kids for cash scandal is, you know, you, you've got real corruption there and, and you can find corruption in lots of places. This one um, is, involves a federal judge in Iowa um, who, before she issued a bunch of warrants to round up a bunch of immigrants on arrest warrants, um, her spouse invested in stock in one of the private prison corporations um, that detains a lot of immigrant detainees. And um, that's because the company is publicly traded. And um, a couple of things about the stock value of, of these private prison corporations. The first thing is um, anyone can buy stock in them. And the second thing is that that the retirement pension plans for our legislators, judges, prosecutors, police are all invested in these publicly traded private prison corporations, as well as in, in other um, industries that thrive on mass incarceration, public and private. The other thing is looking at the value of the stock. So in in 2016, the United States Department of Justice released a, a study that compared seven of its private prison facilities under contract with the Federal Bureau of Prisons with the public federal prisons. And it found that the performance varied so greatly that the Department of Justice announced it was no longer going to contract with the private prisons. It would allow the existing contracts to run their course, but not renew them. And there would be no new contracts. Well, we had a um, national election three months later <clears throat> and the Trump administration came in and reversed that. But the reason I mentioned the stocks is that when the Department of Justice um, released that report, the stock values of Geo Group and CoreCivic tumbled and a lot and they tumbled because the projections of the number of people 
that would be incarcerated in their facilities went down. So the stock value is directly tied to bodies in their prisons. The second thing that happened was that the shareholders of one of those companies sued the management. Well, that wouldn't happen in a public corrections system, <clears throat> entirely public corrections. Of course, then we, after uh, Trump was elected and Jeff Sessions announced that they were reversing the Department of Justice policy and would start using private prisons even more, their stock values shot up again, based on projections of the number of people. So the stock values are based on these contracts, which by the way, are procured through public auction. So a prison corporation sends its, re its, its bid or uh, response to a request for proposal to a government entity over a number of lives that it will take charge of. And then people get transferred from one location to another as a result of these commercial transactions. In that circumstance, the mandate value of one person incarcerated is the same as another. So these people that go through the system truly do become commodifies, commodities um, on corporate balance sheets. There's a, a question or more of a comment, I guess, that we should check our retirement accounts to make sure we don't invest in any of this. Um, and I see Diane mentioned that socially responsible investment doesn't include for-profit prisons right now. Um, we have had a bunch of communications with this group. Uh, they're part of the American Friends Service Committee. They put together this database called Investigate. Um, so you can go to investigate.afsc, American Friends Service Committee.org. I can post it in the chat, I guess. Um, and it's a it's a very cool tool because you can like paste the investments and the funds that you're invested in, and it will tell you if if you're invested in any of these three categories. They have prisons, occupations, and borders. You can just look at prisons. You can look at different stuff, um, and it's a really cool tool because it, it it sorts it out for you very quickly. I will say it's very hard, even if you know that you're invested. So let's say one, one of the things that can happen is you look at your investment portfolio, you plug it into this tool, it pops out and says, yeah, you're invested in uh, you know, this fund through Vanguard or whatever, um, or through your 401k is invested in these companies. Uh, I, I personally experienced that even talking to a fund manager at one of these companies, if you have a 401k that's managed you know, through your group, they can't they, they not all of them have the ability to find a specific uh, fund to see if it has it into like has any of these uh, per particular stocks in them. So, you know, it's it's one of these things that you can do it. It takes a lot of work sometimes, depending on how your investment for portfolio is structured and all of that stuff. But um, you can run into brick walls at, at different places. Um, so just just a heads up, that information is out there. It's something that I think you definitely could and should do. But there's challenges that come along with that. So mm -hmm. I think we we talked a bit about what comes before, um, and John mentioned this briefly. But uh, so, like, what happens during detention? And this is this is obviously where we're focused, right? Like the actual private prison facilities themselves. Uh, and if you think about how money comes into the, the system and what that money gets spent on, these are like the four main ways that they spend money: staffing, training, education, rehab programs, and the facility itself. And if you look at how the companies are structured, staffing makes up a, a huge portion of their expenditures, right? And so if you're looking as a publicly traded corporation to increase your profit margin, what you do is you decrease your staffing cost. And that looks differently and you know, there's different angles you can take. Number one, you can just not hire as many guards. And we see that all the time. In private facilities, they have fewer guards uh, per person that's incarcerated there. Um, they they do things like leaving positions open and not filling them. So a, a lot of these facilities have very, very, very high turnover. Um, there's stories of people have been there a very short amount of time, one year, two years, who are some of the most senior frontline guards because the churn is so high, right? And then when people leave, they just don't rehire. They seriously undertrain their staff compared compared to public facilities um, to be a, a public guard in a in Arizona it's something like I, I don't know John do you know exactly how long it is off the top of your head it's like a pretty long process to get certified 
I don't. I think it's 16 weeks, but I'm not certain of it. The yeah. uh, the one thing I would mention with regard to what you're saying, Rob, is I would direct people if they're interested. We have a podcast on our uh, website and we completed the first season, which includes a trailer and 10 episodes. It's linked on the homepage of our website. It's called the Prison Cells Podcast. And you can find it on all the major platforms. The reason I mention it now is that there are two particular episodes, one where we interview Brian Daw, who has been a career uh, public corrections officer, union organizer, and the like. Um, he's now working for a national organization that is trying to unify some of the correctional officer issues. They talk a lot about what it um, takes to become a correctional officer and the differences between being a certified public corrections officer and a security officer at a private prison corporation. The second interview is of Shane Bauer, the author of a book in 2018 called American Prison. And he writes about his experience. He's a journalist. He writes about his experience undercover as a security officer working for a private prison in Louisiana where once again, he talks about these staff deficiencies. Also to come back to Rob's comment about these facilities so often being in remote locations, the remoteness itself contributes to the difficulties in staffing, um, both in terms of being able to find people to work and for making them work long hours because of staff shortages. And I, I sort of joked on that podcast with Shane Bauer that like, it would be worth our time to just have a podcast where all we did is read his book because I literally could just talk for an hour about just tidbits from that. But to highlight just what we're talking about, they were in such need of staff members that he put that he was an investigative reporter on his application and they hired him anyways. Like they, they, are, they just don't care. They need warm bodies in there because otherwise they can't run these things. Um, it, it's just, it's wild. The, the, the safety... Uh, we have the the OIG report that John mentioned. These are all federal prisons and federal contract prisons. And one thing that seems to be clear in people that we've talked to is that the feds do a better job of oversight compared to the state counterparts. But even in these allegedly better overseen facilities, they're worse on almost every single metric compared to public counterparts. And as people that are you know interested in criminal justice, it's not like public prison facilities are these pristine, well-run operations, right? The, the, the floor is not that high if you're trying to be better. Uh, and, and private prisons just fall short on all sorts of metrics in terms of more contraband, more lockdowns, more uh, security incidents, more disciplinary reports. They're just like, they can't keep up. Um, and it, it's, that's a, you know, sort of neutral party, this uh, OIG report. There's also because private prisons have only been around, it's getting longer now, but they sort of increased in step with the war on drugs. And as the incarceration state in the United States really started to take off, private prisons were a huge boon. And so in the last 15 or 20 years, there's been enough data there for academics to start looking into it. Um, and almost uniformly, with a couple of exceptions that I'll mention briefly, almost uniformly, when these academics are looking at it, and these are these are not sort of like lefty ACLU type folks, right? There's a lot of econ professors um, that are doing this fine grained analysis and multiple regression models and all of this stuff, right? There's this one that was done by Professor Mukherjee and she found that in, if you were, if you spent time in a private facility, you were going to spend approximately 10% more time compared to a similar person in a public facility. Right. So simply by being placed in a private facility, because of these factors, the more incident reports, less safety, fewer options for rehabilitation and education efforts, you were going to spend more time there. Right. And uh, that that was a very quantitative economic analysis. We've we've spoken on the phone with her a few times and, you know, she talks math and in a way that we don't. And she just can explain these things in a very statistical, persuasive way. 
A another uh, study that came out in the last handful of years was a more qualitative study, and it was in the upper Midwest and found that private facilities, people in private facilities had fewer uh, opportunities to engage in education and fewer opportunities to engage in rehab programs. Um, and so there's these like rigorous academic studies that are coming out to support this. And the reason I think that's interesting is because there's this theoretical thing, right? Like we've talked about so far, which is like, if you're going to run a business, you're going to be profit maximizing. How are you going to do that? Well, you want to increase the amount of revenue that you're generating and decrease the way that you're spending money. And that makes sense to people. We can talk about that, but now we're actually getting sort of hard data to back that stuff up. Um, and the other thing about it is, do we have this in here? There, there's actually like a real question about whether they can deliver on the promise anyways, right? Like let's take them at their word and say, because when they're pitching themselves to state governments, they say the pitch is we can save you money and we can provide the same level of services and we can do it cheaper because we don't have to do these things like government pensions and deal with the red tape bureaucracy and all of you know the arguments that Ronald Reagan types have about how government operates. And we can apply that to prisons and we can do the exact same thing and save you money and we'll make money and everybody will be happy. But there's actually, there's some real questions about even if that's the only thing that we cared about with saving money, whether they can deliver on that promise. Do you want to tell the story about the Arizona legislature, John? Well, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things about that. And I, I certainly want to come back to a couple of big questions, which is, why are we doing this work? And what about the Constitution? But um, the uh, Arizona legislature, we started using private prisons inside the state of Arizona, I believe, around 2005. This industry experienced its birth in the early 1980s. So as Rob mentioned, um, during the early years of the Reagan administration, the first Reagan administration, there was, there was um, uh, basically a philosophy that whatever government does, the private sector can do better and more efficiently. And so there was a move to privatize a lot of government functions. And to be clear, we're not making a case against public-private partnerships generally. But we don't think operating a prison and taking away a person's liberty in the most fundamental way should be in the same conversation with, with contracting to maintain a highway or operate a hospital. So, um, and, and, and so the Arizona legislature, I believe back in earlier years was, was quite convinced that the private prison industry would do things better and less expensively. And so they commissioned the Arizona Auditor General to conduct a study every two years uh, to compare the costs of Arizona's public versus private. Well, the first report that came out, the Auditor General concluded that the privates cost more. And you would think that would result in more studies and let's see how it goes. But instead, the legislature killed the report. There have been no more. Um, so the public doesn't get to know because it, the Auditor General didn't reach the conclusion they wanted. That's the power of, of the industry. But, but to go back to a couple of things, um, I, I wanna make sure that we at least outline our constitutional theory. Um, but I also wanna talk about where we started. Why are we doing this when only about 10% of people incarcerated are in private facilities versus public. And, and, and it really comes down to this. You have to start someplace. And this is an issue on which a small group of people might be able to have a significant impact on systemic reform. So if you think of most prison and jail cases, and I've done some of that litigation in my past, those cases are about the facts on the ground, what's happening. The law is pretty well established. It's a question of, is the medical care adequate? Is it overcrowded? Are people safe? Have they been properly classified? All kinds of issues, but it's about the facts, what's happening inside the facility and the facts on the ground 
may constantly change. And then when you get to a judgment and you have to spend a ton of resources to prove to the court what those facts are or to get to the point of a consent decree. And when you get to a judgment or to con consent decree, you're not even halfway home because then you have to enforce it. And it's a cat and mouse game for years and years and years. Our case is going to be somewhat different in that much of our case is going to be about the law. What does the Constitution say or mean in the context of privatizing incarceration, a core function of government? And it raises a bigger issue of can we privatize all functions of government? Well, obviously, we can't outsource the presidency. Can we outsource to private interests the conduct of our public elections? We already outsource a lot of our national defense. Is that wise? You know, how deep has our thinking been when we decided to make incarcerating people a profit-making um, business? And, and our country, unfortunately, in this area has a very long history, not just of enslaving people before 1865 when the 13th Amendment was adopted, but also then using our criminal justice system through laws like the Black Codes to re-enslave freed slaves and their children in the name of profits. So we've decided we need to go to the courthouse on this one, and we think a small group can have an impact on this. We view profit incentive in the criminal justice system as a cancer and it's spreading and it threatens the integrity of the system. And unlike the racism that Thurgood Marshall and his colleagues were faced with when they litigated Brown versus Board of Education and had to overturn an existing Supreme Court precedent on Jim Crow. This industry does not have deep roots. It um, is only used in some states and we need to challenge it, hopefully successfully before it gets those deep roots and becomes regarded as too big to fail. So um, that's why we've picked this issue. And of course we have to convince judges that the constitution should be interpreted as we think it should. It is in many respects, a case of first impression and we don't know what the courts are going to decide, but we do know that the answer is no if we don't ask them to decide it. And so that's why we're focused on this issue. I know it's 152. So if anybody has any lingering questions, feel free to throw them in there. I, I wanted to follow up just a little bit on this saving money point because it's it's something that you know it's one of those things that to me that seems very fundamental like if they can't even deliver on their promise what are we doing here um john explained the arizona one uh in hawaii it was slightly different but i think points at one of the this like fundamental issues here um hawaii also uses private prisons as john mentioned they they're an island, they don't have a lot of space, so they send a lot of their people to private facilities and other places. And so somebody in the legislature said, excuse me, Mr. State Auditor, can you figure out whether this is saving us money? And the state auditor tried and spent a, you know, a chunk of time trying to figure out how much it was costing him, costing the state. And in the end, the, the auditor's office threw up their hands and said, actually, we can't figure out how much it's costing us. And it's, it's complex, this issue, because a lot of times, like the, the simple, naive way to do it is just look at this compensated mandate, right? And say, okay, we have a thousand prisoners and they cost $9,000 per year. So that's 90,000 per year. And you multiply it by the years and, and all of that stuff. Um, but what the auditor general found out in, in Hawaii is that there's actually all of these hidden costs that get sort of uh, left behind if you do this simplistic analysis, right? Which is, we still have to pay for oversight, but that oversight person is a, is a public employee. And if he spends 50% of his time overseeing public facilities and 50% of his time overseeing private facilities, do we assign 50% of his salary and benefits to a private facility? Or, you know, it actually costs more time to go and travel to Arizona. So how do we figure that out? Um, are we just 
cutting the entire uh, public staff in 50% and just multiply, but that doesn't really work either because you know there's all of these built-in efficiencies if everybody's working inside of the same public system. So it, even after spending all of this time, the auditor department wasn't even able to tell the legislature whether it was saving money or not. And you know the the best studies who are often done by academics who are funded by the day one alliance or some uh you know some combination of the private prison corporations the best studies in favor of using private facilities find that they cause that they save the state like one percent of money compared to a public facility right and these are the best possible case studies and so I think there's really serious questions that like if, if you're an honest person and, and the only thing you care about is saving money for the state, right? Sort of a, a traditionally conservative viewpoint. I think there's very real questions that you should ask these lobbyists when they come to you and say, we can save you money. The answer is like, can you really? And how sophisticated are you gonna, gonna do it? Because there's a lot of tricks that they can use to manipulate the costs as well. Um, John often talks about how they can, they can, separate out the kind of person that they're more likely to be able to take in a private facility by saying, we're only going to be like a medium one type of facility. And if you're a medium one type of facility, you're only going to be receiving people who are you know, being incarcerated for this length of time, for these sorts of crimes, who are this big of a security risk and this big of a flight risk. So you can often, you know, in the proposal itself to build the private facility, you can set up this scenario in which you're taking the cheapest prisoners right and then when even when you when you're comparing per prisoner cost well if you're more likely to get cheaper prisoners because of the way that you structure the contract how do we take that into account and so there's i i think the weight of the evidence is that private prisons don't save money and there's enough studies out there at this point that are coming to that similar conclusion that i think like even on their own terms they don't work um and so so that's that's one thing there. Um, I, I wanted to come back just the, the, sort of the final thing to close out. Um, we talked about the four stages and there's this thing that happens even after release, right? We, we talked about what happens at the policy stage when you're in front of judges during detention. Uh, there's a, a lot of people in the majority of people who are involved with the criminal justice system are on these sort of probation, parole, post-release supervision, uh, alternatives to incarceration. That's where most people are at in terms of how they're dealing with the criminal justice system. And there's a new wave of cases that that are sort of in various stages that are challenging this sort of arrangement. And the, the one I've pulled up, uh, you can see that this, this one private company was getting paid per person per month that they were being supervised, right? And one of the things that happens when you're on probation in a lot of states is that you have to submit to like a urinalysis test. And because you're on probation, the state can do it whenever they want. They can call you up and say, you got to take your analysis test. Um, and one of the things that this lawsuit alleged was that as you were getting closer to the end of your supervision, this private corporation was increasing the amount of times that they were performing these urinalysis tests. And the person has to pay for those. And if, and the final little twist is if you miss a urinalysis test, that counts as a, like a, a strike or something, however they term it, in your probation, right? So they can revoke your probation or parole if you miss one of these tests. And this, this lawsuit alleges that what's happening is because they know that they can keep people on parole if they miss or probation, if they miss these things, is they just ask them to do it more and more and more as they get closer to their date. And so you can see how it's like any time you can imagine this profit motive interacting with the criminal justice system, some business person is going to figure out a way to be like, hey, we can make more money off these people somehow. And every time that's going to work out badly if you're the person on the receiving end of it. Fundamentally, what we're saying is that the status of the jailer matters, that, that the jailing entity should not have a profit incentive to see you fail and to keep you there longer. And the way this system is set up, that's exactly the incentive we've embedded in the system. So I wanna make sure I mention this again, our website, abolishprivateprisons.org. Um, we do survive on private donations only. If you're so inclined and certainly not in, in uh, any way com competition with secular Arizona, 
you know, sign up for our newsletter. And, and if you want to support us, we would welcome it. And, and the good news is, too, there a C3C can write it off, <laughs> you know, um, if that matters to you. Um, I uh, really appreciate this conversation. I did put something in the chat that if you felt like you needed, it's just such a good talk. I mean, maybe maybe you come back and give us an update at some point, because I learned an awful lot today. Um, and I don't think I realized that the... Um, what is what is the new term that the new prison director is saying? It's not inmates anymore. It is residents, right? I'm trying to correct my language, um, but the residents, I didn't know they had to pay for their own urine analysis. I mean, they have to pay for everything. That's unbelievable to me. It's such a double dipping scam, and I just wish more people were tuned into it. So thank you for the work that you all do. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, the hope that we have today is this organization that's doing this really important work. Thank you so much, Robert and John. I appreciate your time. So um, please, if you're so moved, uh, throw some cash their way so that they can continue the good work that they're doing. And I hope that everybody has a great weekend. Take care. Thank you.